Intel Platform Controller Hub Flexible I.O. Buckle your seatbelts, ladies and gentlemen. This one is going to get techie. Welcome to Gadget Blues, this is Casey, and today we are going to have an extra special technical video about the way that the Intel KB Lake Z270 Platform Controller Hub actually allocates its PCI Express lanes in a flexible manner called Flexible I.O. On the way in, we'll clear up some misconceptions about PCI Express lanes and how many there are in the platform and how they all work together. So it's time for some extreme whiteboarding. Now, I am neither an artist nor is my penmanship something that monks would admire. So let's uh, give me the benefit of the doubt on that one and just talk a little bit about those PCI Express lanes. So we've got the CPU, the Intel 6 or 7 series, socket 1151. This thing has 20 lanes of PCI Express. It gives 16 out to slots. And the other four is called DMI, Direct Media Interface. This is used to connect the CPU to the platform controller hub. This is the one chip that handles all of the IO on the system. In the early days of the transition from the North and South Bridge to the platform controller hub, the early PCHs had all of their devices baked in. They were static. You had networking, audio, serial, parallel, all of that legacy stuff. It was all baked into the, the platform control hub, PCI bus, and so forth. And that was all static. These days, most of it is dynamically allocated. There are still a couple of things like HD audio that are baked in, but the primary function of the PCH is to have 30 lanes of high-speed I.O., which is Intel's generic term for PCI Express lanes or other type of I.O. Most of these can be flexibly allocated to different kinds of devices, but six of them are hard-coded to USB 3. So we have a total of 24 in Z270. That was 20 in the Z170 platform before it. They have increased it by four. These 24 HSIO lanes can be configured as PCI Express devices, network, SATA, or USB on a flexible basis. Some of these are pre-programmed in and hard-coded by the motherboard vendor, and others can be configured by the BIOS or automatically by the motherboard and switch back and forth between these functions as needed. One thing rather confusing that you'll see in the Intel specifications is you can have a total of 16 devices. Now, there are 24 HSIO lanes, total of 16 devices. What that means is you can have 16 endpoints out of the 24 HSIO lanes. So if you group things together, for example, if you have a PCI Express X4 slot, that would count as one device towards the 16. So for example, what you can't have is 24 USB 3 ports or 24 SATA ports or 24 individual lanes of PCI Express. You're gonna have a total of 16 devices using 24 lanes of HSIO. There are also some rules about which devices can be switched on which lanes of HSIO. So you can't just mix and match these infinitely. Each lane has two or three choices of things that it can be. Some of them can only be PCI Express lanes. So you have to look through this chart and say, of these, uh, I want six of those and four of those, and with 12, you get egg roll. Now, when I say that these allocations can change, for example, you might have some of these PCI Express lanes plumbed out to both an X4 slot 
and an X4 M2 slot. So a, a regular PCI Express slot and an M2 slot. And you will see notes in the manual, hey, you can use one of these or the other. If you populate the M2 slot, then you can't populate the PCI Express slot or vice versa. The motherboard is switching back and forth dynamically based on the devices that you plug into either of these ports. If you happen to plug devices into both of them, the motherboard will probably preferentially pick one or the other of them and the other device will not work. Also clearly the number of SATA and USB 3 ports that you can actually implement is limited by the number of physical SATA and USB 3 ports that the motherboard vendor plums out on the edge of the board. This is why you see so many different variations among motherboards, just models from the same manufacturer that have different layouts of slots and number of SATA ports, number of USB 3 ports and so on and so forth is because this is all very, very flexible and you can make these choices fairly late in the design stage. Do you think that your particular market segment of gamers wants a PCI Express X4 slot more than it does an M2 slot? Or does it want an X4 slot more than it does more X1 slots to plug in sound cards or something like that? This is something your market research needs to advise you of, and then you have to work within the limitations of the flexible I.O. arrangement from Intel. To bust a couple of myths on this that you often read in write-ups, the KB Lake CPU does not have any more lanes of PCI Express than the Skylake CPU. It still has 20 internally, of which 16 are usable for pinouts and four go to the link to the platform controller hub. That's why you sometimes see a confusion between whether the Intel CPUs on 1151 have 20 or 16 lanes. It's because of that four lane use for DMI. The other thing that you will see in some of these write-ups is that KB Lake has more PCI Express lanes than Skylake. And that is true in the sense of the platform controller hub. It has 24 versus 20 in the previous platform. And I think that Intel did that because of Optane technology. See my other video demystifying Intel Optane because they wanted to offer Optane with no strings attached. They didn't want to say, oh, hey, you can use this new Optane technology, but only if you forgo one of the device endpoints that you previously had on Skylake. That might be considered a step backward by some people. So they're making it a superset. You can have your cake and eat it too. You've got an extra four lane, so you can have up to a four lane Optane device in addition to all of the IO capability that you previously had in Skylake. And that's a good thing. Mind you, all of this IO, this 30 HSIO lanes have to go back through the four PCI Express lanes configured as DMI to the CPU. So it's all through this bottleneck. All of your SATA ports, all of your USB 3 ports, all of your networking, and all of your non-CPU connected PCI Express devices have to go back through that link. This also adds a little bit of latency. Today, the PCH has evolved to become basically a glorified PCI Express switch, similar to the PLX switches that you see on some other boards to expand their IO capabilities. You may get different performance, say on a really fast PCI Express SSD, based on whether you plug it into a slot that is connected to the PCH versus a slot that is connected to the CPU. Even with an M2 device, you have the choice of whether you want to connect it to the CPU or to the PCH, because there are PCI Express card adapters for M2 that you can plug into a slot. So all of the M2 slots are actually going to be plumbed through the PCH, but if you put the M2 SSD onto a PCI Express slot adapter card, it can plug into one of the slots that's connected to the CPU. That's going to knock your video card, if you're running one video card from PCI Express X16 down to PCI Express X8, but if you care more about your storage performance than you do about your gaming graphics performance, that may be a choice that you want to make. Of course, the latency difference is fairly small, so eh, what the heck? PCI Express M2 adapters are pretty inexpensive, so you could buy one and try it out. 
you can't go plugging things into a CPU connected slot if you have dual graphics cards because dual graphics cards will each take eight lanes of PCI Express and there's no fallback to lower than eight lanes for graphics. So if you put two graphics cards in Crossfire or SLI, then you can't plug anything else into CPU connected lanes. If you really need dual graphics cards plus extra lanes to run devices directly on the CPU connected PCI Express, then you should consider the X99 or Socket 2011-3 platform, which has processors with 28 and 40 PCI Express lanes built into the CPU. If you go with a dual socket configuration using the workstation version of X99, you can have two CPUs each with 40 lanes of PCI Express and enough expansion slots to fit your wildest dreams. Personally, I'm a real junkie for having incredible expandability. So my primary system is actually not only running X99, but it's running an X99, the Asus X99-EWS, which has dual PLX switching that expands those 40 lanes to give you 64 lanes of PCI Express. So every X16 slot on the board actually runs at X16 all through, down through a bottleneck of 40, which is not very constrictive bottleneck, 64 down to 40. But my secondary systems run on the 1151 platform and they're perfectly fine with one graphics card and typical storage. You wanna go X99 if you need all those lanes of expansion for multiple graphics cards plus other devices such as 10 gigabit ethernet or other plug-in cards or you need greater than four cores in the CPU because even with KB Lake, Intel had hinted earlier on that they were going to do a six core version of KB Lake and some of the leaked stuff on that site, WCCF Tech, but that has not materialized at launch. There's been a lot of people underwhelmed by the fact that KB Lake is performing almost identical to uh, the Skylake in all the benchmarks, but if they had launched a six core version, that would have made it exciting enough. I guess they didn't want to cannibalize their sales of the X99 2011-3 platform. But I think eventually within the life cycle of this socket, we will see a six core CPU as soon as the market demands it, such as if uh, AMD Zen turns out to be a terrific performer. The benchmarks and the demos at CES this year indicate that it might be that level of competition we need to accelerate the CPU wars. I hope you found this really technical look at the Z270 KB Lake flexible IO structure to be fascinating and educational. And we will catch you in the next Gadget Blues video. Please like and subscribe and have a good one.